انما سلطانه على الذين يتولونه والذين هم به مشركون واذا بدلنا ايه مكان ايه والله اعلم بما ينزل قالوا قالوا انما انت مفتر بل اكثرهم لا يعلمون قل نزله روح القدس من ربك بالحق ليثبت الذين امنوا وهدى وبشرى للمسلمين وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُمْ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بَشَرٌ لِسَانُ الَّذِي يُلْحِدُونَ إِلَيْهِ أَعْجَمِيٌّ وَهَذَا لِسَانُ عَرَبِيٌّ مُبِينٌ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. A very, very warm welcome. And indeed, that word warm today is meant in its true sense because we're really experiencing a cold front in South Africa. And therefore, we would like to wish all of you a really, really warm welcome. Hoping this session is going to not only uh, warm our minds uh, today, but at least bring us some physical warmth as well. So our participants who are joining us today are mostly from South Africa, and that makes sense because we're dealing with a topic um, that is very, very specific to South Africa, which is basically a piece of legislation that has been enacted and which we will talk about just now. But we also have amongst our participants some participants from Indonesia, and we welcome you uh, to this session. Now, this session is another installment uh, from OCAF, uh, which is a series of um, webinars that it has been hosting on corporate governance for NPOs um, in South Africa. And we've had quite a few sessions thus far, if I could just remind you, uh, some of you may have attended our previous sessions, but um, how to create an ethical MPO, risk management and internal controls, board effectiveness and succession planning. And the last one, which was held um, at the beginning of this year, was on strategic planning. And so this afternoon, we're going to be looking at something very, very different. Uh, we're looking at a specific piece of legislation. And you've probably heard this acronym being bandied around quite uh, often since the 1st of July, which is POPIA. And no, it's not a political term or any kind of swear word. It's the short for Protection of Personal Information Act. And now the minute we hear that particular topic, we say, well, it's protection of personal information. What really does this have to do uh, with NGOs or NPOs, which are organizations, etc.? And that's exactly what this session is about. It's going to basically deal with the legislation and we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at how this piece of legislation is going to impact the NPO world um, in South Africa. So that's what uh, today's session um, is all about. Uh, just for all of you who are either audio streaming or have registered, etc., there's various platforms on which this particular webinar uh, is actually made available to you. So live, we are actually on Teams at the moment, MS Teams, but Alcaf Essays YouTube um, um, website, Alcaf Essays Facebook website, and lots of the past sessions that you may have missed are also available for you um, on the YouTube page of Alcaf. So um, without much ado, I would like to then introduce to you um, our presenter and our guest for this afternoon. And um, I just like to say that 
when Alcaf actually puts uh, a program together, we make sure that we try to bring you um, the expert in this field. And today we have done very same for you. Uh, our presenter for today is an attorney, Shahnaz Manga. Uh, she's actually a senior associate in a very, very well-known firm in South Africa. But this uh, firm does not only have its base in South Africa, but it is an African-based firm. It's Edward Nathan Sonnenberg, which is one of the largest law firms in Africa, boasting some 600 practitioners um, across the continent. Now, coming back to our um, guest, Shahnaz holds an LLB degree from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And I have to say at this moment, a very, very proud moment for me. I was one of Shahnaz's lecturers when um, she was studying for her LLB. So thumbs up to Shahnaz for reaching this particular point in her career. She's actually currently reading for her master's degree in banking law and has different areas in which um, she'd like to see herself specializing in, in commercial litigation. And she would like to have a focus on disputes arising in the financial um, services, broadcasting and media industries. Very, very topical areas that Shanaz is researching. Her experience includes assisting clients in arbitrations and matters proceeding in the High Court, Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. And she does also advise on non-litigious matters. She also has been extensively involved in a number of high profile disputes and her areas of focus include administrative law, banking law, privacy, contract and constitutional law. And then I'm going to hand over to Shahnaz, who is going to take over and give you all the information you're going to need on Papia. Jazakallah and assalamu alaikum to all the attendees this afternoon. Once again, Jazakallah for the very, very lovely introduction, Munira. And like Munira said, I was fortunate enough to be lectured by her during the completion of my LLB. So. My knowledge that I have today, Munira, definitely played a pivotal role in that. So as an attorney would, we're going to start by looking at the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. Section 14 of the Constitution guarantees the right to privacy. It reads, everyone has the right to privacy, which includes the right not to have their home searched, their property searched, their possessions seized, or the privacy of their communication infringed. The right to privacy includes the right to the protection against the unlawful collection, retention, dissemination, and use of personal information. Papia fleshes out the right to privacy and gives meaning to the broad right entrenched in Section 14D. So what is Papia? PAPIA is the Protection of Personal Information Act being a South African piece of legislation that came into effect from 1 July 2020. Yes, that's right, 1 July 2020 is when the provisions of PAPIA came into effect. But in terms of the Act, there was a grace period of one year, which meant that you only needed to comply with the Act from 1 July 2021. The main objective of PAPIA is to promote the protection of personal information. As mentioned, it is an important piece of legislation that gives effect to the right to privacy by regulating the manner in which personal information is processed. Papia details the conditions that prescribe the minimum threshold requirements for lawfully processing information. The Act itself provides data subjects with rights and remedies to protect the processing of their personal information that is not in accordance with the Act. The first question today is, does PAPIA apply to NPOs? The answer is yes. PAPIA applies to the processing of personal information where the information is entered into a record by or for a responsible party, where the record has been made by automated or non-automated means, and where the responsible party is domiciled in South Africa or domiciled in South Africa or where the responsible party is not in South Africa but makes use of automated or non-automated means within South Africa. So what does this mean for NPOs? To answer this in simple terms, it means that NPOs need to lawfully process personal information in accordance with the provisions of PAPIA. We must bear in mind that PAPIA does not 
ban the processing of personal information, but it rather seeks to impose minimum requirements that must be met to validly process information. Before we look at the Act in more detail, it will be useful for me to set out a roadmap of what will be discussed today. Firstly, I will take you through some of the important definitions set out in Papia. I will then discuss the eight processing conditions which MPOs need to, as a minimum, satisfy when processing personal information. Third, we will look at the information officer and then consider the con concepts of direct marketing and the cross-border flow of information. And lastly, what happens when there is non-compliance with Papia? We now turn to the definitions. In terms of Papia, there are two types of, of, of information. The first is personal information, and the second is special personal information. Personal information is a category that relates to identifiable, living, natural persons or, or existing juristic entities. Personal information includes a large category of information, being race, gender, educational, financial, contact details, the opinions, views, or preferences of a person or about a person. Special personal information is sensitive information closely tied to a data subject. Special personal information relates to the religious or philosophical beliefs, race and ethnic origin, trade union membership, political persuasion, health or sex life, or the biometric information of a data subject. It also relates to the criminal behavior of a data subject regarding the alleged commission of an offense or any proceedings in respect of an offense committed by a data subject. The processing of special personal information is prohibited unless certain requirements are met. Similarly, the, process of, the processing of information relating to a child is prohibited unless certain requirements are met. We will touch on those requirements later in the session. By virtue of what I have just mentioned, there are a few role players in Papia. The first is the data subject. The data subject is the party to whom personal information relates. A data subject can be either a natural person or a juristic entity. In the, content, in the context of NPOs, the data subject would be an individual or entity making a donation to the MPO, the zakat recipient who is receiving the donation, or a volunteer who assists the MPO. We then have the responsible party. The responsible party is defined as a public or private body or any other person which determines the purpose and means for processing the personal information. For purposes of our discussion today, an NPO would be the responsible party. The operator is a third party who is appointed by the responsible party to process information on the responsible party's behalf. The definition of, of an operator is the party who processes personal information for a responsible party in terms of a contract or mandate concluded between the responsible party and the operator without the operator coming under the direct authority of the responsible party. For example, an operator would be the third party entity appointed by an NPO to collate all of the information received on a form and they are requested to transfer, transfer that information on an, onto an electronic database. Another example would be an entity who is, who is appointed to safe keep documents for the responsible party at an off-site location. In terms of Papia, a responsible party so, must yeah. enter into a written agreement with an operator. So in terms of Papia, a responsible party must enter into a written agreement with an operator to ensure that the operator establishes and maintains security measures, which are referred to in condition seven, which we will discuss a little later. The final party is the information regulator. The information regulator is the juristic entity tasked with ensuring compliance with Papia. The information regulator performs the functions and duties prescribed to it in terms of Papia, 
as well as the Promotion of Access to Information Act, which is commonly known as PIA. The function of the regulator is to ensure the lawful processing of personal information in terms of the Act, edu uh, sorry, in accordance with the principles of PAPIA. And if we sort of summarize the duties of the information regulator, they are required to provide education on the Act, monitor and enforce compliance with the provisions of PAPIA by public and private bodies, consult with interested parties, handle complaints submitted to it, conduct research regarding the privacy regarding privacy and data protection, issue codes of conduct, as well as facilitate the cross-border cooperation in the enforcement of privacy laws. If we just touch briefly on the complaint procedure, the information regulator is obliged to investigate a complaint. In exercising its investigative powers, the regulator may summon witnesses, compel the provision of written or oral evidence on oath, receive evidence irrespective of whether it is admissible in court or not, and enter and search premises. The information regulator also has the power to impose both criminal and civil sanctions in terms of the act. So the next part deals with the eight processing conditions. So chapter three of PAPIA sets out these eight processing conditions. These conditions are the minimum requirements that NPOs need to satisfy to lawfully process personal information in South Africa. So the first condition is the accountability of the responsible party. This condition aims to ensure that the responsible party complies with the conditions for lawful processing, thereby ensuring the safety, the, uh, thereby ensuring the safety, security in, and integrity of the processed personal information. The first condition requires compliance with all eight conditions of lawful processing and all measures that will give effect to it at the time of determining the at the time of determining the purpose and the means of processing and during the processing itself the practical implementation of the first condition requires an npo to take reasonably practicable steps to ensure that the personal information which is processed is complete accurate not misleading and updated we then move to the second condition being the processing processing limitations. Condition two limits the scope and ambit of the processing of personal information by requiring compliance with four sub requirements. The first is the lawfulness of the processing of information, meaning that all personal information must be processed lawfully and in a reasonable manner that does not infringe the privacy of the data subject. The sub requirements, although it's not expressly recorded in the act, also requires the processing of information to be done in a fair and transparent manner. The issue of what constitutes a reasonable manner is not dealt with in the act, but this is largely dependent on the circumstances of each case. The second requirement is that of minimality. This, this means that the purpose of processing must be adequate, relevant, and not excessive in relation to the purpose for which the information was collected. The sub requirement limits the boundaries in which personal information can be collected and thereafter processed. The third requirement relates to consent, justification, and the lodging of objections. Section 11 of PAPIA deals with consent by the data subject and the justification of processing information in the absence of consent. The requirement of consent has been argued to be one of the most important requirements of processing information. And on that point, PAPIA does not state that a responsible party or the NPO in this case needs to have written proof of the consent, but in the event that the data subject challenges that the consent was not provided, 
the NPO bears the burden of proof to prove that the data subject did in fact consent. Section 11 of COPIA also provides that information may only be processed in five broad categories. The first being where the data subject consents. The second, where the processing is necessary in certain contractual scenarios. Third, in certain legal situations. Fourth, where the processing is necessary to uphold a legitimate interest of the data subject. And five, where the processing is pursuing the legitimate interests of the responsible party or a third party to whom information is supplied. On that point, it's important to remember that the data subject may withdraw their consent at any time. Similarly, a data subject may object to the processing of their information at any time. If a data subject objects to an NPO processing the information, the objection must be based on reasonable grounds and must be submitted in the prescribed manner to the NPO unless there's a piece of legislation which provides for the processing of such information. In the case of a data subject objecting to the processing of information, an NPO may no longer pro process that data subject's information. The final sub-requirement under the processing, lim processing limitation condition is the collection of information directly from the data subject. There are exceptions to the sub requirement of direct uh, collection, and these exceptions mean that direct collection is not necessary where the information has been made public. If the data subject has consented to the collection from another source, or the collection of information from another source would not prejudice the data subject. And finally, compliance with the direct collection requirement would prejudice a lawful requirement. This processing limitation condition obliges an NPO to process all information lawfully and in a reasonable manner. For example, let's say an NPO collects the residential addresses of potential benefic beneficiaries that were impacted by a, a severe flood in Cape Town. The NPO must advise the potential beneficiary that the residential address will be shared with a courier who is appointed by the NPO, who will then deliver supplies to the beneficiary. In doing so, it would be prudent to advise the beneficiary that without passing the address on to the courier, the NPO may not be able to provide those supplies. This will, this will speak or this will show that the NPO is being reasonable. The third condition is purpose specification. In terms of this condition, personal information must be collected for a specific explicitly defined purpose. This condition regulates the processing of information from the time it has been collected through the period of disse dissemination or linking, retention, and finally the destruction of information. To ensure compliance with this condition, the responsible party must take steps in terms of section 18, which falls under condition six, which we're still coming to, to ensure that the data subject is aware of the purpose of the collection. In respect of the retention and restriction of records, Papier provides that information should not be retained for, a long, for longer than is necessary in order to achieve the purpose for which that information was collected and subsequently processed. There are exceptions to this rule being that the retention of the record is required by law, the responsible party requires that record for a lawful purpose that relates to its functions or activities, or that the retention is required by, the, by a contract, or of course, the data subject has consented to the retention. The final leg of condition three is the destruction of information. Personal information must be destroyed deleted or de-identified as soon as the NPO is no longer authorized to retain it. The destruction or deletion of the record must be done in a manner that 
prevents its re uh, that prevents its reconstruction in an intelligible form. So a prudent manner to destroy hard copies of information would be by using a shredder rather than merely placing a hard copy document containing the personal information of a volunteer in a waste bin. The, the advantage of the shredder would be to ensure compliance as the information will not be e would not be easily reconstructable. The fourth processing condition is condition four being the further processing limitation. Condition four provides that the further collection, the further processing of information must be in accordance or compatible with the purpose for which it was collected. In determining whether the further processing is compatible, the following factors must be considered. One, the relationship between the further processing and the original purpose. Two, the nature of the information concerned. Three, consequences of the intended further processing. Four, the manner in which the information was collected. And five, any contractual rights and obligations between the parties. The compatibility question doesn't need to be asked if the data subject consents to the further processing, that information is publicly available, the further processing is used for historical, statistical or research purposes, or the regulator has granted an exemption which allows the NPO to further process that information. We then look at the fifth condition, which is information quality. In terms of this condition, NPOs must take reasonably practicable steps to ensure that personal information is complete, accurate, not misleading, and updated when necessary. When taking the step, NPOs must have regard to the purpose for which personal information is collected or further processed. In determining the quality of the information that has been collected, an NPL must ask itself, must ask itself certain questions. And these questions would be, what personal information has been collected? From whom has the information been collected? What was the purpose of processing at the time of collection? Is the information complete, accurate, not misleading and up to date? And has there been an excessive or has there been excessive collection of personal data? The answers to these questions will dictate to the NPO what reasonable practicable steps need to be taken to satisfy this condition. We then move on to condition six, which is openness. So the condition of openness has two sub requirements. First is maintaining the documentation of all processing operations and two, notifying data subjects when collecting personal information. The documentation element requires NPOs to compile a manual in terms of PIA being the Promotion of Access to Information Act and that PIA manual needs to, at the very least, set out the contact details of the NPO, a description of the guide, and provide sufficient details to enable a, per to enable a party, whether it's a natural or, or a juristic entity, to request information from the NPO. The second leg being notification to the data subject places an obligation on NPOs to take reasonably practicable steps to ensure that the data subject is aware of seven things. So the first thing, that the information is being collected or the source that the information has been collected from. Two, the name and the address of the MPO. Three, the purpose for which the information is being collected. Four, whether the supply of information by the data subject is voluntary or mandatory. Five, the consequences of a failure to provide the information. Six, the laws which authorize or require the collection of information. And seven, 
the fact that the MPO intends to transfer that information to a third party or an international organization and the level of protection that is afforded to that information by that third party or international organization. If, if the information is being collected directly from the data subject, the data subject must be notified before the information is collected. If the information is not being collected from the data subject, then steps must be taken before, if it's possible, or as soon as reasonably possible after it has been collected. Once these, once these steps have been taken by the MPO, they are regarded as having been complied with for the subsequent for the subsequent collection from the data subject for the same information if the purpose of the collection remains the same. The biggest exception to the general rule is if the data subject has consented. The seventh condition is security safeguards. So NPOs are required to secure the integrity and the confidentiality of personal information in its possession or under its control by taking appropriate reasonable, technical and organizational measures to prevent loss, damage or unauthorized destruction of personal information and the un unlawful access to or processing of personal information. In order to give effect to this condition, an MPO must take reasonable measures to identify all reasonably foreseeable internal and external risks to personal information in its possession or under its control. They need to establish and maintain appropriate safeguards against those identified risks. They need to regularly verify that the safeguards are effectively implemented. And four, NPOs need to ensure that the safeguards are continually updated in response to new risks or deficiencies in previously implemented safeguards. The starting point is having regard to, the, to, to generally accepted information, security practices and procedures. It's also important for an NPO to ensure that an operator who is processing information on the MPO's behalf is complying with condition seven as well. Operators can only process personal information with the knowledge of the NPO, and they must treat that information as confidential and they cannot disclose it unless they are required to do so by law or it's in the course of the proper performance of their duties. Condition seven also requires certain notifications to be made in the event that there is a security compromise. This means that when a responsible, so when a responsible party suspects that there are reasonable grounds that a data subject information has been accessed or acquired by an unauthorized third party, the NPO must advise the data subject and the information regulator. The notification must be made as soon as possible after the discovery of the compromise. The notification to the data subject must be in writing and it must provide sufficient detail, so it must provide sufficiently, sufficiently detailed information to enable the data subject to take protective measures against the potential consequences of the compromise. The notification to the data subject must at a minimum include a description of the possible consequences of the compromise, a description of the measures taken or to be taken by the NPO to address the security compromise, a recommendation to the data subject, subject setting out what steps can be taken to mitigate the possible adverse effects of the compromise, and the identity of the unauthorized person who may have accessed or acquired the personal information if it is known to the NPO. As, as a case study, let's look at the recent unrest in KwaZulu-Natal. Let's say that an NPO's office was looted and upon investigation of the NPO's office, it's clear that equipment such as laptops and files containing, uh, containing hard copies of personal information 
have been removed from the NPO's office. This would constitute a compromise of information that would require the NPO to report the incident to both the information regulator as well as the affected data subjects. In the notification to the data subject, it would, you will recall that the last requirement is to identify the unauthorized person. But in this case, it would not be possible to identify the unauthorized person because she or he is unknown to the NPO. This is also a good example to highlight the importance of why an NPO needs to know exactly what information is in its possession and how that information is stored as this is an important piece that would be required when notifying the data subjects. If, for example, the NPO did not have a, an organized filing system, it wouldn't know whose information was contained in file three to seven of 15, which had now been removed, and that would make its job a little more difficult. We then go on to the last condition, which is the data subject participation. This condition provides a right to data subjects and a corresponding duty on NPOs. The purpose of condition eight is to provide data subjects, data subjects with a measure of influence and control over their personal information. In terms of condition eight, data subjects have the right to request an NPO to confirm free of charge whether or not it holds any information about the data subject, the data subject is entitled to request a record or a description of the information that is held by the responsible party or by an operator on behalf of the responsible party. And if the data subject requests a copy of the record, it's also entitled to be given an estimate of the fee before the record is provided. An NPO on receipt of a request for information may refuse to provide requested information if it falls within one of the grounds of refusal in PIA, being the, promo uh, being the Promotion of Access to Information Act. And an example of one such ground would be that the information is the confidential information of a third party and therefore it cannot be disclosed. In terms of this condition, a data subject also has the right to request an NPO to correct or delete personal information. If such a request is received, the NPO must also provide the data subject with evidence that the information has been corrected or deleted. So, for example, if a donor to an NPO advises the NPO that its address has changed, the NPO would be required to update its records and for the proof of the update, a screenshot of the updated information, and I am presuming that information has been stored electronically, can be sent to the donor with a covering email that confirms that his or that its details have been updated. Before we move away from the processing conditions, we need to go back to the processing of special personal information and information relating to a child. Please excuse me. The general rule is that NPOs may not process special personal information. However, there are exceptions to this rule. One such exception is if the data subject consents to the processing of that special personal information. This means that the responsible party can process the special personal information in accordance with the eight processing conditions. If the data subject does not consent to the processing of special personal information, there are specific provisions in PAPIA that allows for the processing of it. For example, section 28 of PAPIA provides that special personal information, such as the data subject's religious views, can be processed by a religious organization if the information relates to a data subject belonging to that organization. However, that organization can, uh, cannot provide religious views, being the special personal information of a data subject, 
to a third party without obtaining the data subject's consent. A simple example of this would be a masjid processing the special personal information, specifically the religious views of a musalli that often attends that specific masjid. And in terms of section 28 of Papia, that masjid can process the special personal information without the musalli's consent, but the masjid cannot then pass on that information to a third party without the consent. There, there's also a, prohib a prohibition on the processing of information relating to a child. However, the personal information of a child may be processed if it is carried out with the consent of a competent person, being the child's parent or legal guardian, where the processing is necessary for the establishing exercise or defense of a right or obligation, necessary to comply with an obligation in terms of international public law, or it's for historical, statistical, or research purposes where it would serve the public interest and even and it would be disproportionate to ask for consent from the child's guardian or parent or legal guardian. In respect of both categories, an NPR may apply to the information regulator to authorize the responsible party to process either special personal information or the personal information of a child if that processing is in the public interest and appropriate safeguards have been put into place to protect that information. So that sums up the processing conditions as well as the processing of special personal information and information relating to a child. We now turn to the information officer. In terms of Papia, an information officer must be appointed to ensure compliance with the Act. In an MPO, the automatic information officer would be the head of the organization, being its chief executive officer or the equivalent. However, an NPO can appoint an alternative individual to be the information officer and register him or her with the information regulator. In terms of Section 55 of Papia, an information officer is responsible for the encouragement of compliance with the conditions, dealing with requests from the MPO, dealing with requests made to the MPO from the information regulator, working with the regulator in respect of investigations, and of course, ensuring compliance with the provisions of FAPIA. In terms of FAPIA's regulations, specifically Regulation 4, an information officer must also ensure that a compliance framework is developed implemented and maintained, a personal impact assessment is done to ensure adequate, adequate measures and standards exist in order to comply with the provisions of PAPIA, a PIA manual is developed, and internal awareness sessions are held within the MPO regarding PAPIA. An information officer plays an important role in compliance with PAPIA, and for this reason, there are provisions in PIA for the information officer to be held personally liable in specific instances. We now turn, we now turn to the application of PAPIA on direct marketing and the trans-border flow of information. So direct marketing is the sale of goods and services directly to a customer, including the promotion of those goods, or including the promotion of the sale of goods or services. Section 69 of Papia provides that personal information cannot be processed for the purpose of direct marketing via any form of electronic communication, including automatic calling machines, fax machines, SMSs, and emails unless the data subject has consented has consented to receiving marketing of that nature or the data subject is an existing customer of the NPO. In this regard, the NPO must have obtained the details of the data subject through sales of a product or service 
and the marketing should relate to similar products or services of the NPO. If the data subject has not consented, an NPO may approach a data subject to request their consent on a single occasion if they have not previously objected. It's important that data subjects are given an opportunity to consent or object to receiving direct marketing material via electronic means. If an NPO elects to send a communication to a data subject for the purpose of direct marketing, the communication must contain the identity of the sender as well as an address or contact details to which the data subject may request that such communication stop. We then turn to the transborder or cross-border flow of information. An NPO may not transfer information outside of South Africa unless the third party who is receiving the information is subject to a law, binding rules or binding agreement that provides an adequate level of protection to the information to the information which has similar processing conditions to those contained in PAPIA and requires the same of the third party when further processing the information. In addition to complying with this requirement, the data subject must consent to the transport of flow of in information and an NPO may only transfer information if it is necessary for the conclusion or performance of a contract that has been concluded in the interest of the data subject, or the transfer is for the benefit of the data subject and, and, it, and it's not reasonably practicable to obtain the consent, which would any event be forthcoming. An example under this category would be sending the details of a potential Zakat recipient to a potential donor in Germany where the GDPR applies from which Papia has drawn influence in order for a donor to pay their zakat. The transport of flow of information requires an NPO to take extra steps to make sure that they do some sort of investigation or get confirmation as to what regulates the protection of personal information and the processing of that personal information in the third party country. We now turn to deal with non-compliance of PAPIA. So what happens if an NPO doesn't comply with PAPIA? In terms of the Act, any person may lodge a complaint with the information regulator alleging interference with the processing of personal information and the regulator is authorized to investigate such a complaint. In addition to laying a complaint, the data subject or the information regulator at the data subject's request may institute civil proceedings against a responsible party when the data subject, uh, data subject claims damages for the breach of, for example, a processing condition. If a person is convicted of an offence in Papua, for example, breaching confidentiality, he or she is liable to imprisonment for a period not exceeding 12 months or to a fine, or to both a fine and imprisonment. If a person is convicted of a more serious offence, such as obstructing, obstructing or unlawfully influencing the information regulator, he or she is liable to a fine or imprisonment for a period not exceeding 10 years, or both. Papia also provides for the imposition of administrative fines where a responsible party is alleged to have committed an offence in terms of papia. The fine may not exceed 10 million rand and is payable into the National Revenue Fund. If an, if an NPO receives an infringement notice imposing an administrative fine, it can either pay the fine, make arrangements with the, regulation, with the regulator to pay the fine in instalments, or elect to be tried in court. So now that I've given you a background to Papier, the question mean, so the question that arises is what steps need to be taken? So I would say start off by appointing your Papier team and assign responsibilities to them. 
depending on the size, the scope, and the function of your organization, appoint either a dedicated PAPIA compliance officer or a full team and determine who is going to be responsible for the processing, for the storing, for managing, and for the destruction of personal information that your organization holds, including past and present clients. The second step would be to conduct an initial assessment of your NPO. When doing so, measure the risks that your NPO faces against the principles contained in PAPIA. Have regard to whether you have a privacy statement on your website. Does your NPO have an existing PAIA manual? Does your NPO engage third party operators? Once this initial assessment has been conducted, create a plan so you can ensure remediation and compliance with the Act. The third step would be to assess the personal information in your NPO's possession. When doing so, locate all of the information, all of the information relating to the NPO, which includes past inf or in personal information relating to past clients, as well as the current clients or donors, beneficiaries, volunteers of the NPO. You also need to consider what type of personal information it is. Is it, pers is it ordinary personal information? Is it special personal information? Or is it information relating to a child? And in light of that, consider whether any of that information can be or ought to be destroyed at this stage. And the final step, is to ensure continued compliance with PAPIA. At the beginning of the discussion, I referred to the constitutional rights of privacy and said that the aim of PAPIA is to protect this right. Bearing the importance of the act in mind, NPO should not look at PAPIA as a tick box exercise, tick, tick box exercise, but focus on continued compliance to ensure that we all play our part in order to give effect to the fundamental rights of privacy. When doing so, NPOs need to remember that compliance with PAPIA is an ongoing destiny, is an ongoing journey and not a single destination. So that's all from me in terms of the background. Marita, I'm not sure if you have any questions that you'd like me to deal with or yeah, I think that's all from me for now. Shukran Shahnaz, you have uh, educated me today. Thank you so much for that. You know, when um, the whole Papia thing first came about, I was very excited because I said, ah, there goes all this telemarketing. I'm not going to be subjected to this calls all the time, etc., cetera, et cetera. But today I realize the broader implications um, of Papia. And I think you've dealt with the whole issue of how it uh, affects our membership at this point in time, which is the NPOs uh, very, very well. And yes, we do have quite a few questions for you. So we'll uh, take them along as we go. And uh, for those of you who want to ask questions, please do post them on um, the chat box and I will try to get Shahnaz to answer your questions for you. Okay, so let's kick off Shahnaz with a very uh, sort of good question, I think. Is there an exemption for small organizations and our SMMEs? I'm, I'm sure they all are thinking about this. You know, we're not big enough to have to do all of these things because there's quite onerous steps that have to be taken um, with regard to Papia. And the short answer to that, Munira, is no. They are no exemptions for small for SMMEs or for or for NPOs and PAPIA applies to every single party that processes information. The only exception to that is when you're processing information for of a purely personal nature. So for example, at home between you and your family, you're creating a budget and you're taking into account your special personal information in the form of financial information. That's for a purely personal purpose, and that is excluded from the ambit of PAPIA. Other, the other exclusions would be if information is processed by cabinet, um, where it involves issues of national security, security. 
and it's related to a court's judicial function. And the last one is where personal information is processed for solely ju uh, journalistic, literary and art, uh, artistic purposes. OK, makes makes a lot of sense um, in that respect. And this is a very, very interesting question. In fact, when I read this question, it's got me thinking as well. You know, with so much happening in terms of artificial intelligence, etc., and all of that, is Poppia some form of human control? <laughs> that that is an interesting <laughs> question. So, this is also a personal view, and I think the question was asking for my personal view. I don't think that it's a form of human control. Having regard to Papia as a whole, the one thing we can see is that it's aiming to to flesh out our right to privacy contained in the Constitution. So as an individual South African citizen, it, it, it gives me a little more comfort knowing that who's ever processing my information is doing so in accordance with the piece of legislation. And in the event that they don't process it in accordance with Papia, there are consequences that they can face. So it's taking, taking the right to privacy very seriously. Yeah. The next one is something you did deal with in your uh, presentation, but I'm just going to raise the question so you can just uh, refer them back to that particular point in your presentation. But what are the penalties for companies? And I would think more in terms of who we're targeting here, the NPOs, if they do not comply. I think it, there's some serious implications for non-compliance here. They are, Munira, so that's right. There are very serious consequences for non-compliance which is why it's so important for an NPO to take all reasonable steps that it can. And I think, you know, this is a new piece of legislation and it is the first piece of legislation in South Africa that deals with, with the right to privacy at this level. So as long as at the end of the day, an NPO can show that these are the reasonable steps that I've taken and this is why I shouldn't be imprisoned if it's a complaint against an individual i shouldn't have to pay a fine and the organization as a whole shouldn't receive an administrative fine and of course we want to avoid as much as possible having to expend financial resources on legal costs to fight this battle in court so it's just like i said to you i, I premise this question on the basis that it's, it's so important to take reasonable practicable steps and that I can't tell you, I can't say that, OK, to be reasonable, this is what you have to do, because that's not how the law works. When you're looking at reasonableness, you need to take, in the, in, take into account the circumstances of processing in that context and go from there. Yeah, especially around the question of the administrative fine that you raised. I mean, I mean, you know, my eyes popped out when you made that particular point. And I'm just thinking that NPOs are in, in financial constraints as it is. I can't see them, you know, so they really need to take this business about getting their act together in terms of compliance quite seriously and not just let it ride by because the implications are so drastic um, in this event. Well, your whole, your whole presentation is basically aimed at answering the next question. How will the act impact on NGOs? So I'm not going to ask you to now go ahead and, 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 and uh, repeat that particular question. We've had one on the chat, sure. uh, which basically is, what impact does Papia have on the financial audit of NPOs? So remember, when a when an audit is being conducted of an NPO, that is for a legitimate purpose. But when the auditor comes in or during the audit process, it needs to be made clear to the auditor that this contains personal information or the special personal information of of the of the data subjects that have provided information to the NPO. And in light of that, the auditor needs to ensure sufficient safeguards are in place to lawfully process that information. And then they too would have to comply with the aid processing condition. OK, um, I'm seeing that there's a hand up and uh, I think it's from Farinese Hassam. Farinese, could you perhaps uh, please type in your question or query on the chat 
while we are busy dealing with some of the other questions. Thank you. OK, so the next question is also a very, very interesting one, because generally when um, legislation is promulgated and it's new, there's a lot of time periods involved in giving people, uh, you know, time to adjust to the uh, requirements of a particular piece of legislation, etc. So in terms of popular now, what are the current systems in place with regard to processing or is there some kind of uh, a rollout program? you know, that you will be allowed to do things by this time, that time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think this is very, very important then in, in terms of appointing your information officer and following those steps that you asked us, you know, to do in your presentation. Sure. So I think if we just start off with the, the basic processing of information, in terms of a papia, the rollout period for the eight processing conditions have come and gone. So I mentioned right at the beginning, the commencement date of the Act was 1 July 2020, but in terms of, if I'm not mistaken, Section 114, there was a transitional period of one year. So those provisions or compliance with those provisions only had to start from 1 July 2021. But so it seems that the rollout period in respect of the main principles of PAPIA has come and gone. There are still exceptions and there are various other sections which are coming to coming into effect later on this year. So, for example, the, the creation of a PIA manual only needs to be done by the 31st of December of this year, so it was extended for another six month period. So if there's a specific question, we have to refer back to the Act and confirm that, OK, is this part of the eight processing conditions? If yes, we've got to already be complying. If not, does it fall within one of the other sections which are still to come into effect? But like I said, for the most part, the commencement date of the Act was 1 July 2020. Okay. And how is the compliance going to be monitored? I mean, clearly they're very, very serious about this particular act and its implications. But then we've seen with other, even with some of the judicial decisions, monitoring on the part of government um, is, 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 is a challenge for them. So how are they going to actually go about monitoring compliance with POPIA? Sure, so in terms of, so to answer that question practically, we, we don't know it yet, so the Act is very new and we will have to wait and see as to how the information regulator approaches monitoring compliance and spot checks and uh, things of the like. But in terms of the Act, the information regulator may, on its own initiative, make an assessment as to whether the processing of personal information by a responsible party complies with POPIA and the same can be requested by a data subject. If the regulator makes a decision to conduct an assessment, the regulator will issue an information notice where it sets out, uh, so sorry, let me just go back. The regulator will issue uh, an information notice to the NPO wherein it will set out the nature of the assessment, what information it requires from the NPO to conduct its assessment, and also the fact that the NPO has a right of appeal to so basically a right to appeal the assessment the part the responsible party will be informed by this notice what information the regulator requires so if it's a case of a breach of confidentiality or, or let's not let's not be so severe let's say it's an assessment of whether the records are updated so we would have to go back and say sure here's all our information and this is when they're updated and on that part it may be a practical exercise for the NPO to say okay this is the date that the information was collected and this is when we updated so you can see we updated in March 2020 in October 2020 in January 2021 and that may be some of the information that the regulator requests but like I said at this stage it's difficult to predict what information the regulator will call for, but it's prudent for an NPO to ensure that it has proof of compliance with the condition to the extent that it is possible. And um, 
many of the organizations that exist in South Africa, the NPO, especially amongst the Islamic uh, NPOs, a lot of them are charity-based organizations. And uh, the sort of profile of your your data, uh, you know, uh, person changes a lot. And so one of the questions is, well, uh, what if we are receiving requests on a daily basis? So, you know, that, that information is sort of changing. It's so fluid in nature. How are they going to actually maintain compliance in that particular fluid uh, scenario? Okay. And so, again, it would be, it would be, compliance with the eight processing conditions and in the case where it relates to financial information that then falls within the ambit of special personal information so we need to remember that we need specific consent there or check whether it falls within one of the exceptions provided for in the act and i, I hear what you're saying Munira. this is a daily basis thing and my answer to that is that means we will be ensuring compliance with those eight conditions on a daily, on a basis. daily basis and that okay. and, and i appreciate that that's probably multiple times a day and uh, another question then that's also coming from uh, these sort of um, if we want to group them as charity organizations um, are we allowed to share charity recipients details with our donors so you know the, the different groups of information that you're dealing with so here the question is well these are the recipients obviously when you're receiving donations you're going to have to say well i've spent the money on x y and z and whatever and whatever so how much of that are you actually going to be sharing with the donor and again it's, it's difficult to answer that question without having the full context in mind because if it's a case of the donor wants the information just for for interest purposes i think the the npl will face some criticism if it's just saying oh here we go this is the person who who received your donation but if we can prove that there's a legitimate purpose in sharing that information with the donor we may be able to satisfy the the processing conditions but again it is very very much dependent on the context in which that request arises you know, I've seen uh, this is just something that I that hit my mind while you were talking. You know, a lot of the times we see these organizations putting out brochures yes. of the work that they do. And very often there's pictures of the recipients that they've given, um, you know, donations to or, or service to. I mean, surely Popia is not going to impact on that, right? So it, it definitely will. But I suppose the, the easy answer to that is at the time of taking the photograph, if it's, for example, if, they, if you take a photograph of handing them a food parcel, they, you would at that stage need to say, are you comfortable for me taking the photograph and can I use this in a brochure in the future? I mean, at least that way we've got the consent requirement. Okay, so it seems that the next few questions, I'm just going through um, the list here. We've dealt with quite a few as we've been chatting, right? So um, I'm going to move on to a question here. In normally in our funding activities, we usually try to look for information about donors everywhere. So for example, we would look on their Facebook profiles and then later through research, their email addresses. Does this new law mean now we cannot do this anymore? So that that would go back to condition to being the processing limitation. The question that needs to be asked is whether the task of checking Facebook profiles and later obtaining email addresses is linked to a specific, explicitly defined and lawful purpose. So if we can answer that question in the affirmative, then I think there is a basis to say that there is a a lawful purpose which we're doing this and then obviously process that information with the remaining seven conditions okay um the next one will we've uh, dealt with uh, and again it's your entire um, presentation but specifically around exemptions you dealt with that quite uh, well you told us of those three categories that uh, which qualify for the exemptions and then again the next question immediate obligations for small businesses you've explained the steps that you need to take in order to become compliant so yay we've, we're doing really well Yoshinas. Um, 
this is an interesting question, though. A little bit political, I suppose, but uh, what negative impact will Papia have on the country as a whole? I mean, this is a, a very um, fledgling sort of democracy that we have at the moment, which seems to be threatened at all particular points in time. And now here's something like the right to privacy being protected uh, in this particular. So is this a step of trying to maybe get back our democracy or, you know? I think, I think at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is give effect to that right to privacy. And, and I understand that in giving effect to that right to privacy, at the same time, we're complicating somebody else's life. And in this case, it would be an NPO. So let's, let's just go into that a little more. So initially, the responsible party or the NPO will need to expend significant amounts of resources in the form of both human and financial or monetary resources to ensure compliance with Papia, specifically the processing conditions. But it seems to me that once proper processes have been implemented, the continued compliance will have an overall benefit for the country. But again, that is uh, my personal view and that's my personal information. But that, yeah, that's, that's my answer to that question. Okay, um, I have a question here, which is basically, and, and normally this is something we generally do after every session where we try to make some kind of positive impact for those who attended, but this is specifically around uh, perhaps a basic manual on Papia uh, that could be put together. And I'm thinking here it would probably be directed and targeted at the NPO world, uh, not just, you know, your sort of broad implications of Papia, but rather uh, an a manual dealing with that. Is, is is there something that you would be working on uh, for this? So <laughs> to answer that question, that is something that we are as attorneys usually paid <laughs> to do. But I am I'm happy to take this offline with with you and Mr. Badat and we can always have a chat about it in further detail. OK, and then there's another very, very interesting question, which is very detailed in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, when you are entering into agreements with donors, mm. right, um, in terms of poppy consent now, um, would it be, I think this is something that we need for you again for us to work on together, but it's basically asking you to look at what some of those agreements would be in order for there to be compliance with, for example, this constitutes my consent as required under uh, Poppia, et cetera. The management and the finance department of Alcap SA will have access to my, you see, I, so um, I think which is very, very good is that now the organizations are already starting to take those steps towards uh, compliance. But um, that question came from Zainul. Zainul, I'm sure we're going to um, look at this uh, when you are actually uh, taking those steps in order for you to, and when you come to that point where you're entering into an agreement with uh, uh, the donor. Okay, uh, let's see what other questions we have. Farinese, I'm still waiting. If you still have your question that you wanted to raise or a query, perhaps. Um, oh, this is, this is very interesting. How do we as, NPOs, which is it's a very specific NPO, safe home and a feeding scheme sort of NPO, make sure that we are compliant. So pro they probably don't even know some of the people that they're donating their uh, 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 services to. Right? So how does it impact on them? So again, I think the first thing that we'd have to establish is what kind of personal information they are processing. So if it's if if it's a feeding scheme of sorts, you're right, they unlikely to know the personal information of the person, of the recipient of the food. So different implications would apply there. But at the same time, they may be processing the personal information of a donor in the sense of, I am going to transfer X amount of money into the scheme's bank account, and then will you do this? And in terms of that, we'd have to go back to the egg processing conditions. But again, the easiest way to ensure compliance is to appoint your information officer. Ensure that that information officer is 
uh, has the relevant knowledge relating to Papia and allow that person to seek advice. Let them reach out to people who, who have the background in Papia so that they, at the end of the day, know what's required from them. And if they know what's required from them, they will be able to ensure that the NPO is satisfying the processing conditions at the end of the day. But it's important not to just cross your fingers and hope that everything works out, because that this is not the, the type of legislation for that. There's specific requirements, there are responsibilities, there are duties. So we need to make sure that as an NPO, we do everything that we possibly can to ensure compliance. OK, uh, another question here, which is basically on the chat um, and it's tied in with the manual, I think. Um, can we obtain a checklist for conducting an initial assessment? So I think when we when we do put that manual together, I'm sure uh, one of the annexures would be a sort of checklist. I think, um, you know, I know it's a mentality, this checklist, this thing, <laughs> but it does help, you know, in this particular situation now, do I have this? Do I have that? Have I done this? Have I done that? Information officer appointed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, Munir, just, just to say on, on the initial steps, I think it's easy to say, OK, this is my to do list rather than a checklist. And I worry about the term checklist because it almost seems that once I pick the box, I don't yeah. need to worry about it again. And with Papier, that's not the case. We need to continue worrying about those processing conditions. So we can definitely look at put together, put, we can look at creating a to-do list. So at the beginning, this is what you need to do. And it's simple things. So one of the questions that we, we need to ask ourselves is the information that's being stored on laptops. Are those laptops, when you switch it on, do you have to use a password? Does it automatically lock after 15 minutes? Are employees or volunteers of the organization taking steps to ensure that when they leave the laptop, they're not just walking away and leaving open the financial information of, of a Zakat recipient, for example. So it's, it's, it's things like that and those kinds of questions that we need to start looking at. And, and, and I know that a lot of these things that I'm saying seems almost second nature, but if somebody walks into an NPO's office and I have in my desk three files opened with information pertaining to three different projects, the person who's sitting on the other side of my desk can easily look at those documents and that would be a compromise in terms of Papier, which would then trigger the notification requirements and you want to avoid reporting small incidents which are easily avoidable to the information regulator as well as to the data subjects because at the end of the day it's also got a, a reputation element for, for the NPO. OK, um, Hassanein, does Far Farani still want to ask her question manually because I see she's managed to put it on the chat. Um, OK, that's fine. All right. So uh, how does Popier then impact on data retention policy of an organization? So it seems like I, I think some organizations don't even have that policy to start with. I think now is the time they're probably going to have to. Definitely. Well, uh, Fernie, I'm very impressed that you are already thinking about the data retention policy because that does fall within one of the requirements and this may be the appropriate time for NPOs to revisit policies of that nature if they are in existence and say, okay, I've recorded that I keep a list of the beneficiaries for 20 years following which they will be destroyed. Maybe now is the time to ask yourself, but why are we keeping this information for 20 years? Is there a legal obligation on me to do so? Should I not keep this for five years for auditing purposes and then destroy it? You know, those are the types of questions that are being asked. So that need to be asked rather. So Fanny needs to answer your question. You need to go back and make sure that your data retention policy as in line with the retention provided for in terms of Papier. So uh, should you be keeping and it's just ask the simple questions and the difficult, the, ask the simple questions 
And the easy answer seems to help solve the difficult problem, if I can put it that way. OK, then another interesting question, Shanaz, we might we might be ending up going a little bit over time. Where does the whistleblower's rights and the NPO's rights fit in this structure? So remember, in an organization, there should be a whistleblower policy. And in terms of that policy, the, the details of a whistleblower is always kept confidential. So uh, I, I see a whistleblower policy and Papia actually working quite nicely together. But again, that's that's a difficult question to ask without the full context or without an example, because it also may be dependent on the specific facts of that incident. OK, cool. And the last question, um, and then we'll tie up after this, and I think we've dealt with it to some extent, but anyway, let's deal with it. Do we have a template on how to initiate and launch the position of popular compliance sector within an MPO? Well, obviously, that's something we want to work towards achieving, but I'm going to let you have your last uh, say, uh, Shehnaz, and then we'll close the program. So I would just like to say to Zatla for the opportunity Papia is such an important piece of legislation and if you walk away with anything today, I hope it's it's just the fact that you can appreciate the impact that this legislation has on our day to day dealings and hopefully we can work together on improving those processes going forward. But Jazakla again to Oka for having me, Jazakla Munira for facilitating this, it's been such a pleasure. Shukran Shanaz, I was, like I said in the beginning, very, very proud to present to you, uh, to, to present you to our um, um, participants today. Uh, let me then take the opportunity of um, saying thank you to everybody. Gratitude is a big part of us being human. So to all our partners, firstly, uh, as you all know, this series of webinars are jointly hosted by uh, four partners, it's, which is Alcaf SA, the National Alcaf South African Foundation. And then we have AMAL, which is the Association of Muslim Accountants and Lawyers, and that's how I got involved in this program. SANZAF, the South African National Zakaf Fund, UKSA, which is the United Ulama Council of South Africa. We would like to say thank you to um, iSkill for all the technical support that they have uh, produced to make these webinars possible. And of course, a huge thank you to our speaker, Shanaz Manga, for sharing of her knowledge on this topic with us. Really, um, I think uh, we cannot underestimate the importance and the impact of Papia on not just our personal lives, but in all that we are doing in terms of the organizations we serve on. To Suleiman Badat for his involvement in coordinating this webinar and the whole program for that matter. Um, um, he's the sort of uh, creator of this whole program and we want to say thank you to him um, for that. Our Kari Tanzilu Rahman Jasim for the lovely melodious recital of the Quranic verses to all our participants without which the webinar would not have been possible. Shukran for all of you who have joined today and who have joined in our past sessions. And I have to say a very, very big thank you to Hassanain. If only all of you know all of the background work that goes into making sure that this webinar works out and is presented to you in the manner in which you get it, then we have to have to salute our soldier on the field, Hassanain Abdullah. Shukran to all of you. Um, for attending, for joining, for contributing, for asking your questions. And just a big um, note to all the NPOs out there, make sure you're going to go after this and start your policies around um, data retention and make sure that you're going to start uh, those steps that Shana has taught us about how we're going to become compliant in terms of this legislation. Shukra alhamdulillah wa alaikum as-salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.
Sanzaf, changing lives through development and relief. I act to make an impact. When we take care of each other, wonderful things happen. Children thrive, the elderly rejoice, communities celebrate. Awqaf South Africa, a charitable Waqaf receiving organization makes it easy to share the care. All donations are plowed into Sharia compliant investments, while the fruits support a great variety of charitable causes. Visit the Awqaf South Africa website at awqafsa.org.za to discover how your waqaf can bless our community with the legacy of care. Awqaf South Africa, share the care.